Welcome to season two of the Get Out of Teaching podcast presented by Larksong Enterprises. I'm your host, Elizabeth Diakos. On the show, we'll look at the who, what, where, why, when, and how of moving out of your education career and into a life you love. In this season, we'll meet ex-teachers who have taken their hobbies and passions from outside of education and created a new career for themselves. We'll talk to people who can support and inspire us as we make the transition and work on identifying the legacy we want to leave in the world. So come along for the ride as we get out of teaching. What keeps you in teaching when you'd rather leave? I'm sure it won't surprise you to learn that financial pressure is a major reason. That's why today's show is sponsored by Chris Carlin, financial planner and mortgage broker from Master Your Money Now. Chris is not about taking excessive risks that you're not comfortable with. He's really careful to help you understand the relationship between risk and return and his fees are very reasonable. Chris can help you sort out your cash flow, pay down debt, and plan your financially strategic exit from teaching, making sure you take care of everything you've worked so hard for. Chris understands personal insurance cover too and can help you make a successful claim so that you don't have to deal with the insurance company yourself. A huge relief if you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed by money concerns. He can even help you plan for retirement. With over nine years' experience in the finance sector, Aussies from all around the country have trusted Chris to help plan their financial futures. Chris Carlin cares for the caring professions, teachers and nurses, helping you to shore up your financial resources so that you'll be in a good position to leave when you're ready. Go to masteryourmoneynow.com.au to book a free 30-minute chat with Chris Carlin and master your money now. Episode 12. Hi everyone and welcome to the show. On today's show, I'm very pleased to be interviewing Tara Malel. Tara, welcome to the show. Oh, hello Elizabeth and thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So Tara, tell us your story. What got you into teaching in the first place? Uh, Do you know what? I started off um, teaching actually from a really young age, from the age of 14. I got a job as an assistant teacher at my dance studio that I grew up in and I loved it. And my role model was my dance teacher. So I wanted to be like her. I wanted to do what she was doing. It was awesome. I mean, you get to dance all day, every day. You get to teach kids how to dance. I mean, like, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So as I started, I absolutely loved it. And I did that. That was my main job um, all the way through. And I ended up acquiring my own classes. So I ended up teaching on my own. And I had an assistant at the age of sort of 16, 17. Uh, And then it gets to the HSC. We do all of that. And you've got to put in your preferences for uni. Hmm. And I was like, like most 18-year-olds, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I want to do. I don't, I've only just gotten through school. Now you're telling me I was do more study, and so I on, happened. So did you want to um, like continue dancing? Did you plan to do that? Look, I never had dreams of being a dancer per se as a as a performer, but I just love teaching. So what I actually did, I found just by chance, happened to find that at the time, UNSW, so the University of New South Wales, um, had a dance degree or a dance education degree. And again, I was like, I can dance at uni. Yes. <laughs> Nice. And I actually put down, it was a toss up between doing the dance education or uh, criminal psychology. I was really torn between the two, but in the end, the dance won out. So I ended up doing um, a double degree, a Bachelor of Dance and a Bachelor of Education. Wow. Okay. And mm. so, uni. so I went there too for my first degree back in the dark ages. So, and I, actually, I did drama and psychology. So I, we, you know, similar um, 
go. Yeah, so I had drama. I did um, drama, yeah. So I was a high school dance and drama teacher is what I came out at. And actually, I think it was probably maybe two years after I graduated, they shut the course down. So it no longer exists. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that was interesting. Okay, so you, you got your degree and, and mm-hmm. so you obviously live in Sydney somewhere where... Mm, mm. so yeah at the time I was living in Sydney and the interesting part was so we you know it's a four-year degree and it wasn't until the fourth year that we actually did any kind of um practical work and went out to schools and that was quite interesting and I think at the end of that year so the end of my final year um I do actually remember just breaking down in one of my last dance classes going I don't want to be a teacher (laughs) Oh no, after four years. <laughs> after four years, okay, this isn't me. So I had a little bit of a breakdown and uh, it was interesting because I was so torn. I loved teaching. I loved it and I loved engaging and interacting with the students. Um, I taught sort of young preschoolers and kindergartners and all through primary school and I taught high school students as well and I taught adults like I love that but I think it was something about the the teaching in schools and the um the curriculum and how limited and narrowing the methodology was um and doing that practical uh, sessions in um two or three different schools I went to in that final year mm-hmm. I really became disheartened so that was a challenging that was a challenging time and then you add to that so I graduated and turns out there's no jobs for dance teachers right Uh, because in New South Wales we don't value the arts so there really there was no jobs anyone um, or any school that taught dance those teachers were not leaving they weren't going anywhere and um, my course then pumped out you know 25 to 30 new dance teachers every year to go where Right. So that was a challenge. That was a challenge. So I ended up going um, and teaching as a casual teacher over in the UK, in London, actually, which was a whole nother interesting experience in and of itself. But uh, as challenging as that was, it also turned out to be a blessing because that was a really strong catalyst for when I returned to Sydney um, and I ended up starting my own business in dance education. Wow. Okay. So Mm. give me a time frame. You finished your degree, you Mm. did a bit of casual work and how long was that? So I was over in London for about six months. Okay. Six months, um, and I probably learned more about teaching in those six months than I did in the four years at uni. So that was a really big learning curve. And then I came back, and that was sort of that was 2008. Um, and so, of course, 2008, 2009 was a global financial crisis, and actually turned out to be a fantastic time for me to start a business. It was really interesting. I didn't realize it or wasn't fully aware at the time, but because of all the, um, you know, financial crisis that was happening, a lot of the funding to particularly private schools was cut significantly. Mm -hmm. So these private schools were actually cutting whole departments. What's the first department to get rid of? The performing arts department. So while a lot of teachers, it was really sad, they were losing their jobs, but it meant that there was a gap. There was an opening. So schools were happy to continue to do their um, performing arts education and they were happy to pay an outsider, aka me and my new business, Mm -hmm. uh, to come and just pay for the work that we did right so you show up you taught x amount of classes a week so then that's all they'd pay for so it saved them a lot of money um and it also saved them from dealing with all the complaints from their their parents as well so it worked out really good timing actually for me uh but that's really how i started teaching and the makes up the predominant um most of my experience in teaching and teaching in schools as this so just subcontractor. Slow down for a second. What did it look like day to day? Oh, day to day, I was at probably at least two or three different schools each day, delivering programs mainly within the PE curriculum. 
because sports teachers didn't want to have to teach that part. Okay. So um, I was creating the dance programs for them. I was creating assessments um, and the assessment marking criteria. And then schools would then want to have like a before or after school dance curricular program as well. So I started introducing that and building that up. Um, and that's really how my business grew. Wow. Amazing. Mm. Congratulations. Mm. That sounds fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you didn't really get out of teaching. You just kind of segued into doing it on your own terms. Well, just doing it in a different way. Absolutely. And the huge benefit was that I could teach my programs. Mm -hmm. So again, I was not happy with um, the way the performing arts curriculum was written, particularly dance anyway, was written um, in our New South Wales curriculum. Anyway, it's just super boring, super boring, um, which I think most teachers would agree that they find some of their work really boring to teach. Uh, so I got to do it in my way deliver it in my way and then it sort of grew and I was actually then running teacher training programs so I would then um, teach the teachers how to implement this stuff how to continue supporting the students along the way even if they weren't dance teachers or they didn't know how to dance there were still things that they could um, do to support the students to develop their own abilities mm -hmm. as well so that was really empowering um, and I really got a lot out of that I also have to say as well that again I was really great at teaching I was really great at teaching dance so I'd already been teaching since I was 14 mm -hmm. so then the suddenly the idea of starting a business I mean I was 22 when I started it it seemed like a no-brainer right the no one else is gonna hire me so I'll hire myself <laughs> and that's just where we'll go so it seemed really simple and again I was very confident being 22 I was like I know how to teach I got this this is easy what I didn't know and had zero clue about and zero experience was the business side. I had no idea. So yeah. over those next kind of six years that I grew the business, there was, again, a lot of mistakes, a lot of learning and a lot of making stuff up as I went along. So um, the business was really successful and I ended up having 15 staff. Um, it grew really well. And I think it's because one, there was a bit of divine timing. Like I said, the global financial crisis worked out really well for me. Um, and I really found a need, like I found a really strong pain point that uh, these teachers had. So it was quite an easy sell, if that makes sense. It was a, quite an easy sell. So, you know, all these things came together and a lot of hard work, obviously, but I do want to let your audience know if they are thinking of going down that path, if they are thinking of leaving teaching, um, it's okay if you have no business knowledge or experience. Like, that's okay. That's where most of us start out. So... Yeah, it's possible. It. <laughs> well, actually, I, I was a performing and visual arts teacher, but my uh, visual was my thing and drama was fine but dance was like do I look like a dancer I don't think so <laughs> and so I actually had another colleague who worked four days a week and we would get her to come in and teach the for the school production like she'd do the dance stuff and then yes. when it was my turn to teach you know I go oh, I think I can remember the heel toe polka from my own childhood <laughs> so we're learning that today but yeah it was pretty bad and I mean the kids actually had fun because there's a lot of other stuff it. around like in dance, the social mm. side of dance and yes. the courtship kind of rituals mm. around mm. dance. And so I, I would talk about that stuff with them and they'd be going, oh, yeah. no, I don't want to touch it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. but, but the nice thing was that actually they'd go from being really grumpy to laughing at the end of the class. And that was always really gratifying because I'm like, okay, I don't yes. really have a lot of my, my own skill set was pretty low. Um, but I, I was able to get them to love what we were doing, which was kind of my goal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Like, you know, I had like grade threes. And so that was, yes. was pretty fun. 
but um, oh, but it. It, it sounds like what you were doing was at a, at a much higher level than what I was able to achieve. So no, yeah. no, it was a mix. It was a total mix, and that's what I love about any performing arts is it was really about instilling that creativity, that willingness to get it wrong, and that willingness to just keep exploring and and, and working together and and finding a solution and finding a fit. And that's what I really love about any kind of creative endeavor is the fact that there is no right and wrong just do something you know just do it and then see the response how does it mm. feel what does it look like what do people think you know what's the feedback that you're getting and then let's refine that you know yeah. so yeah. yeah absolutely i love it um i'm just going to stop you there for a second sorry i'm just <laughs> okay so um it sounds like you actually were in business uh, and like didn't really leave teaching, but kind of created your own thing. So was there fear mm. for you like to, to come back to Australia and have to start from scratch? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Very much so. So uh, I came back from the UK and like, like I said, had a really intense experience teaching as the ca I mean casual teachers they've got it hard as it is I was in very low socioeconomic areas in the UK super rough I learned a lot uh, so I came back thinking well that's it there goes my teaching career I don't want to do it anymore I'm not interested so I actually found a job at uh, Curves Fitness oh yeah does anyone yeah. remember Curves they're still <laughs> they're around still there's one in my still local around. shopping strip yep Definitely. Uh, amazing. <laughs> so Bondi Junction Curves, shout out to you guys. That's where I started uh, back just for needed a job. And I thought, well, let's go into fitness. Mm. And it was actually through a good old friend of a friend who reached out and said, oh, I've had this school, this private school ask uh, for a dance program. I'm not available. Uh, so do you want to do it? Wow. And it was from working with these guys and again, listening to their needs and what they were looking for and what they struggled with. That's what started it all. So I put in that first proposal and then I thought maybe other schools need this. Mm -hmm. So then got on the phone, reached out to my network and started putting in more proposals and it just grew from there. Wow. But it was very scary. So the fear, yes, 100%, that feeling of, well, what do I do now? Because everything that I had been or thought I was up until that point was a dance teacher. So if I'm not a dance teacher, if I'm not teaching, then who am I? What am I? What do I know? What value do I have? Do I have to start again? Oh, do I have to go back to uni? Do I need to retrain? Yeah, so all of those questions absolutely came into my head. Wow. So just can I take you back to the, those phone calls? Like you said, you reached out to your network. Can you just elaborate on what that looked like? Because I think that's really a crucial element in the success story for a lot of people mm. where they've mm. actually started to ask around, like, who do you know who needs what I have to offer? Mm. Well, it certainly wasn't via LinkedIn. That was not <laughs> happening back then. <laughs> unfortunately so that wasn't happening but it was all the girls that I went to uni with seeing what they were doing who did they know who were they connected to um, past uh, educators from from uni as well and then I did the good old-fashioned cold calling so I searched Google search and all the uh, school directory listings. And I just mm. got on the phone and found who to get connected to, right? Mm. Who was the key? And that was, probably, that was quite challenging to find because every school has someone a little different. Mm. So was it the head of sport? Was there a director of extracurricular? You know, who was that? But mm. uh, just got on the phone and called. And they've also got really fearsome gatekeepers too, in my mm. experience. So it's hard to mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. get through that first sort of you know front line of defense into a school and to find out mm -hmm. information so you obviously yeah. did okay at that you must have been well quite you know 
<laughs> one of one of my standout lessons. Now I don't remember much from my, my uni days. Our dance studio was right next to the uni bar. So look, classes, uni bar, one and the same thing. So I don't remember much from my uni days. But one of the main lessons I do remember is our um, the head of our course said, "Always be nice to the reception and anyone in administration." Right. Sorry. Keep going. Those, that's right. Those are your people. Those are the gatekeepers. Mm. Be nice to them and you can get whatever you want. So I did. So sometimes those were the first people that I spoke to. So I spoke to them. I got to know them. And then eventually I got on a first name basis with them. So anytime I called the school to find out something, whether I was working there or not, I could call them up, chat mm. to them, make friends, how's your grandchildren, how's your niece and nephew, you know, whatever that was. And then they'd, they'd happily put me through to whoever or give me whatever I needed. Sometimes some insider information saying, oh, by the way, if you speak to that person, make sure you say this or don't come at, come at it like this angle, maybe try this angle, which was amazing. Yeah. But yeah, always make friends with the gatekeepers. Nice, nice. Good advice. <laughs> okay, so... You said you had so much to learn and was there worry around the financial side of things for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, so I've had two moments of this and it was definitely, I mean, I was 22. I was living with my parents. So yes, it was a financial worry, but I was living with my parents mm -hmm. and it was just me. I had no one else to look after. So that was fine. So yes, there was worry um, and, and no, at the same time, mm -hmm. but to fast forward this after, after I finished up my business, I sold my dance education business. I moved overseas and then, um, I came back to Australia and again, starting a, another business in a totally new area. So this, this second time, or it was actually the third time round, third business up and running, coming back, starting fresh, there was a lot more fear, a lot more doubt, um, and a lot more financial concerns. Why I is think that? that time. Uh, well, I came back from Africa pregnant. So there was, it felt like a little bit more on the line um, <laughs> this time round. And to do something as bold as, again, one, break away from a career and the comfort of something that you've always known is scary anyway, that's, that's taking a risk. But then if you're looking at going into the field of starting your own business, well, that's another risk again, financially, very much so. You are taking um, a chance on yourself. Mm. And that's something that I don't think we're used to doing. And I know, personally speaking, I was never encouraged to do that. I was never encouraged to bet on myself or back myself. So um, that is something that I've had to learn each and every time I've started fresh, started a new business, gone in a new career direction, uh, moved to a new location. You've got to back yourself. And I think that's the first place to start, really. And then any financial decisions from there, um, they really have to flow from that space of self-belief. Wow. Very powerful. Thank you for that. Mm. So just let me take you back. What were you doing in Africa? <laughs> uh, I uh, totally burnt out, actually, after my first business. Totally burnt out to the point where my passion for teaching and dancing evaporated. Uh, so I ended up selling my business selling everything that I owned, including my beloved car at the time, my apartment, everything. And I moved over to Africa to do some volunteer work. So it was meant to just be for a short period of time volunteering. And um, again, wherever I could, using my knowledge of teaching, of educating, uh, to support different projects over there. As soon as I landed, I fell in love with the place. I was in Tanzania specifically and I fell in love with the place. Absolutely loved it. And each new project that I was introduced to when I was kind of deciding what project that I would uh, join in on, what I realized was I actually had a lot more that, that I could do than to just teach the children there. I could actually one, teach the teachers, 
which is the experience that I'd had from my first business, but then also teach the organizers and the founders of the project as well in terms of business and business management. So using my skills as an educator, which have always come in handy. It's been sort of that golden thread, that common theme. Everything that I do is about empowering people through education, through the acquisition of knowledge. And so it's just that I happen through my experience to know a lot about business and, I, and I'm really interested in it. From teaching dance, I know a lot about creativity and creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. So I use my knowledge of this and my skills of education in each and every one of the businesses and areas that I've been in. So it was a very different experience to the one that I intended to go over there with, but it was great. And I was able to um, get a job and again, financially provide for myself to stay over there for the year that I was there for. Mm. Wow. Okay. So you came back and you were pregnant. Yes. So I met my beautiful partner. <laughs> I met my beautiful partner over there and uh, then fell pregnant, came back to Australia and was once again faced with, I think it was a lot of the doubts or the, the preconceived notions of, I'm going to be a parent. Wow, now I'm an adult and I have to be responsible. Mm -hmm. And being responsible means you have a job. So what did I do? I came back and I found a job job um, in uh, education management. So I was working in a school, but in the management and administration side mm -hmm. of a school which was great because I'd never actually seen that side of things. Even when I was teaching, I was kind of always on the other side. So that was really interesting um, for a time and then became very boring <laughs> and office politics. And I worked out that I'm not a great employee. So <laughs> I did the sensible adult thing and thought this kind of sucks. This isn't all it's cracked up to be. So once again, took a chance on myself and then started my next business when my two children were very young. So that's business number two. Uh, we're up to business number three now. Okay, so so my, business my, number two? Uh, over in Tanzania, the consulting work, I ended up being able to get paid for that. So it started off volunteering, but I ended up uh, getting paid for that. So I was a business um, a not-for-profit consultant awesome. over there, which was okay. amazing. So then you then you came back here and you set, set up your third business. So tell us about that. Yeah, so I started out with coaching um, and I started with confidence coaching, confidence and career coaching for women, particularly women who had just come off maternity leave or was still in maternity leave, uh, going through that big identity change. And what is really interesting, and it sort of made me um, or normalize my experience that I went through after having kids, this whole new identity of once again, who am I? Similar to how I felt after leaving my dance business because I had so heavily identified as a dance teacher that if I wasn't doing that, then I didn't know who I was. And similarly, after the birth of my children, it was like, well, I don't know who I am now. I don't recognize this body. I don't recognize this person. How do I think? What do I feel? What do I do with this little thing? Um, so I had all of that going on and all of those doubts and all of those new fears. And again, I thought, well, if I'm going through this, surely there must be at least one other person that feels this way and perhaps I can help them too. So that started off that third business and that sort of evolved back into once again, uh, business coaching and leadership coaching and development, which is really fascinating. And that's what you're doing now. And that's what I'm doing now. Yeah, that's what I'm doing now. So it's really, again, I still see as I'm educating, using education for empowerment um, and helping people to make the best choices for themselves. So who are your clients now? My clients are mainly women and women who are either changing career or are in that sort of early startup phase. They've made the decision to back themselves to go into business. And they're really just in those first two years getting off that launch pad. 
Mm, great. Okay. So mm. this is uh, a little shout out to all the would be entrepreneurs um, that this is a, you, you might be a really great connection for them to have a chat to them. I, I'm assuming you do some kind of introductory conversation absolutely yeah absolutely i encourage people to jump on and you know i know you'll put all my links below and we can chat about that in a moment but uh but yes yeah, step one is just to reach out and have a chat because you need to be able to connect it's like in teaching as well you know you've got to be able to build that rapport and that relationship with your students with the people that you're working with to really get the most out of it and then we look at what are what are the best ways to support you and me you where you're at now so I have a range of different programs and courses and and different ways that I work with people because one size doesn't fit all it's looking at who are you as an individual what are your um, unique uh, situation what is your unique business that you have now or business idea that you're wanting to bring to life um, and what is then the best way to support you and inform you so you can move forwards right fantastic and so if someone's feeling stuck and they you know um, this is directed at teachers who want to get out of teaching <sighs> what, what advice would you give them because you've had a broad experience now Mm, mm. Look, again, my best advice is to come back to really understanding your why. I mean, if you haven't looked at it already, Simon Sinek's talk about starting with why, it's totally relevant to all of us on a personal level as well. Really understanding who are you at your core? Who are you at your best? What drives you? What motivates you? And that's going to help you then decide, well, what is the, the next right path? Because like I said, I felt lost because I so heavily identified with what I did, as in I was a teacher, and that kind of summed up my identity. But the, the thing is, when we identify with what we do, then it, it becomes so fleeting. Or when that doesn't suit us anymore, we think, well, now I'm completely lost. Mm. When the reality is who you are at your core, your why, your motivation, your greater vision, always stays the same. It's just what changes is how it kind of manifests itself in reality. Mm. So for now, it may be teaching, but the next career path could be something different. But uh, again, I say I have done, like I said, a range of different things, so many different things that seem at first so random. But when I found my why and my core purpose, it all made sense. It all made sense. So now I can clearly articulate that hopefully i'm clearly articulating that <laughs> to the audience now because i know what that golden thread is i know what's at the core and what has driven all of these different projects that i've done mm, fantastic and just what you were saying I've, I'm, I'm like hearing your words and thinking i've said that to people too that if you don't if you don't know like why you're doing it so i was an art teacher and a you know drama teacher and th there was that sort of creative thread through that um and now i do that in this coaching space instead mm -hmm. so there's still the creativity the problem solving the you know let's tweak this or let's do it from yes. that angle or whatever and it's all coming out in a different way for me so i, I, I really resonate with what you just said um mm. so what if someone wanted to get in touch with you to use your service what would be the best way to do that like should they go to your website? Yeah, well, they can find me. I hang out on LinkedIn, so find me at Tara Malel, um, or Facebook. Facebook is where I particularly like hanging out. And you can find me at Business Mastery Tribe. That's the business page. Or if you've got a business already, then come hang out with us in the free Facebook group, and it's called Tara's Business Tribe. There's a lot of live trainings. There's a lot of collaborations and interactions that take place. So it's a really cool space to hang out. So I'd say that's where you go to first. And any events or special trainings that I have or courses that are launching, then you'll find out about them in those spaces. Fantastic. And what would you say life is like for you now? I mean, awesome, crazy. <laughs> chaotic <laughs> but just just so much more interesting 
so much more interesting. I mean, I found working in administration um, was soul destroying, you know, doing something that was no way in alignment with who I am, uh, with what I value, it's soul destroying. So I think, you know, you spoke about financial kind of security and risks. I mean, it's worth the risk. It is 100% worth the risk. I mean, I think regret is the worst thing that we can have. So it's worth the risk in backing yourself and trying, just trying. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've failed. Oh, so many times, so many times I've failed, but it's worth pursuing, right? So are there any regrets for you? No, no, not at all. And I've done some pretty crazy stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Tara, before we wrap this up, what's the legacy that you want to leave in the world? Mm. So my why, and it comes from it comes from my why, from my core purpose. My why is to empower people to embrace themselves so they can confidently pursue their passion and fulfill their purpose. If I can have that impact on people, on the people in my tribe, and they then pass that on to the people in their tribe, mm. and they pass it on to the people in their tribe, oh my goodness, then that's, that's my impact. That's my impact, empowering people to fully embrace themselves. That's what it is. And what a legacy that is. Tara <laughs> Malel, thank you so much for coming on the Get Out of Teaching podcast today. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Get Out of Teaching podcast presented by Larksong Enterprises with your host, Elizabeth Diakos. Do you know someone else who could benefit from hearing more stories of hope and transition from teachers all around the world? Please take a moment to share this and other episodes via your podcast app. Each share helps me reach listeners just like you who can benefit from this content. The Get Out of Teaching podcast is proud to be part of the Experts On Air podcast network. For show notes and other resources, please visit larksong.com.au forward slash podcast.